and it's so great to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. Adam, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, of course. We, uh, we've got, uh, I think, a really interesting agenda to talk about today, and it's all centered around uh, your book uh, that, that came out not that long ago, um, The Surprise Restaurant Manager. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about the book, how it came to be, and, and why you put it together in the first place? Yeah, the surprise part of Surprise Restaurant Manager is the number of times I encounter restaurants where managers were servers or bartenders, but then were just handed the keys. No training, just here you go, now you're a manager. And that's that's great in theory, but the, the challenge is that there's a lot having to do with staffing, development, communication, dealing with strong personalities, and figuring out work-life balance, which takes training and takes help. And so I put this together and I started doing this like really focused, I threatened to do it for about 20 years, but I really started doing it at the end of 2019. And then uh, during the shutdown was able to focus on it, complete it. And probably now more than ever with the staffing crisis that we have, a lot of people are being put in management roles with not a lot of training. So it, the timing does work out as being something that's kind of truly important now. Yeah, we used to joke, uh, like, hey, you're a great server. Why don't you run this place? <laughs> That's right. And, <laughs> and they no said, training, no anything. Just like, here, right. yeah, you're right. Here's the keys. Start making schedules, do the ordering, you know, do the hiring. Sure. Yeah. And then they're yeah. like, why would I want to take a job where I'm making half as much money for twice the work? And that's exactly what being a restaurant manager starts out as. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, honestly, any job in hospitality, to be fair. Yep. It's just, you know, it's getting your foot in the door in that first management position. Um, it's a, it's not only is it a radical departure from what you're used to being a kind of an hourly, you know, I'll, I'll use air quotes around employee. I mean, everybody's mm -hmm. employees, but, you know, you're sort of, your day is really programmed and, and prescribed by somebody to suddenly having to be responsible for a lot of things that you've never really had to think about before. Yep. And, and oftentimes, and there really is no playbook in just about every company, even though they say they, they train people and how to be managers and supervisors, it's really a trial and error situation for most people. It's mentorship. I mean, the, the best way that I ever learned management was working with great GMs and directors and people that took an active interest in working with me. And the same conversations that I've had in my restaurants are the ones that I wrote in the book. Yeah, yeah, I, I love it. I think it's a, it's a great service uh, for people out there. And, you know, you mentioned it already. There's a, we've got a hiring crisis right now, and we can probably argue over the reason for that. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a lot of the stats uh, front of mind here, but, you know, there's, there's um, a lot of jobs open. Uh, you hear in the news that unemployment is... Uh, you know, it's still it's high compared to the the pre pandemic days, but it's significantly lower than uh, where it was even a year ago. Now again, mm -hmm. you know that could be calculated differently than uh, than maybe it was a year ago. There's, so there's a lot at play right now. Um, and one of the topics I want to jump into first of all is this idea of figuring out how to establish more balance in your life in the context of you know, we've we've got really two macro situations going on. You've got people that have been continuing to work during the pandemic who have probably just been run right into the ground, um, having no help or you know anything. And then you've got a whole other group of people that have been looking for work, have been sending out hundreds, if not thousands of resumes, and are getting burned out on the process of trying to find a job, even though we keep hearing that there's all these jobs available and that people don't want to work. So yeah, I think burnout right now is a major issue. Um, and I'd love to talk a little bit about what that looks like, kind of the learnings that you came up with while writing the book and how to avoid it. Well, I think that I go back, if you're, the term workaholic is seen as a positive in our industry. If you're a workaholic, somehow that there's some value in that, how great you are as being, in, being a manager. But if you said that you were an alcoholic, you wouldn't really see that as being a positive thing. <laughs> it, the alcoholic part means that you're out of balance, that there's yeah. something wrong. And this industry rewards people for working ridiculous hours. So you have to have work-life balance. So much more easy to say than to do. But being able to block out 
admin times, those times when you're away from the floor. Because if you're a manager, you have to be there during volume. You have to be there to support your team. But two in the afternoon, you don't necessarily have to do that. But you do have to put the walls up to where you're saying, these are the times I'm doing my administrative tasks. One concept I worked with, there's no walls for the manager office. It's just a table in the back. And I've told the manager that she needs to put a hat on that says, go away when, with a little smiley face. And whenever she's wearing that hat, it's the, the, that's her pretend walls. I'm old enough to remember WKRP and Les Nesman had mm -hmm. his like fake walls that he drew with tape on the ground and he wouldn't <laughs> talk to people unless they knocked on an invisible door. I kind of <laughs> like that because, because there's some sort of like, I'm going to take this time to do that. But what it ends up being is, Oh, I'm going to sit on my couch and do schedules. And that's the best way. You you spend hours and hours and hours in the venue, and then you go home and you say to your family and your friends and whomever else, hi, I still have to work. Mm -hmm. And that balance is just challenging. And if there is a benefit to some of the staffing crisis for management, it's that it is a, it's a seller's market. It's an ability for you to be able to say, listen, I, I fully understand that this position is a 55, maybe 60 hour a week job, 12 hours a day, five days a week. But these are the boundaries. These are the things that I'm willing to do. These are the times and to communicate that because mm -hmm. otherwise you're going to be run to the ground. And that's exactly what happens. That's exactly what happens. And I don't know that this industry has ever been receptive to that messaging where people have tried to set those boundaries. Yep. But it's always, it's always built in a situation to where ownership, senior management is seen as being in the position of power, and they're not. In the same way that staff is seen managers as being in the position of power, they're not. The, the paradigm has to shift. The understanding that every single staff member, every server, every bartender that you have could work anywhere. And if you're good at what you do as a server bartender, you're massively employable. So as a restaurant manager, you have to appreciate every single day when people show up and come to work because they're making an active choice. Mm -hmm. And that's big. The same has to be said for restaurant managers when it comes to restaurant owners. It's just there is a fear for people to speak up and to talk about themselves and to also celebrate their accomplishments. One of the big focuses that I have is self-preservation is self-promotion. It has to be done by allowing people to know what you're doing on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So when you do put those walls up, they say, oh, they've been working so hard doing these other things. I understand why these two days we need to not schedule meetings or phone calls or have them do administrative tasks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting point. You know, the I, I can think back to some of the people that I've worked with in the past who would be perceived as being the most um, uh, sort of out, outwardly successful, uh, most in-demand people on property. And they're the ones that are always busy. And they're always telling everybody how busy they are. <laughs> it's not the person who's quietly sitting back, killing their numbers, getting great results on everything, you know, profitability, p and coming in great, forecasts look good. You know, scheduling's good, expenses look great, guest reviews are good. Like the, the people that quietly just crush everything yeah. are oftentimes the ones who who get passed over for promotion because people don't actually think that they're doing anything. Correct. And they they find that they find being introspective, they find being uh, modest. They were they were raised the way that most of us were raised, which was be modest, be respectful, and you'll be recognized for your efforts. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to be. There's just there's too many other things that are going on from a senior management ownership level to where if you're a restaurant manager and you're doing your job, they are very possibly thinking about many other things because they think, oh, you've got this handled, you, you're good. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're tracking your accomplishments. And you do so many things within a given day and a given week to where you create an environment to where you're not managed which means that you'll be passed over for a promotion when that time comes because you're not the person who's promoting yourself. Right. I and don't, sorry to cut you off, but no, yeah, don't wait good. for that yearly review. If you even have 
performance reviews in your in your restaurant or in your hotel. A lot surprisingly still today a lot don't. But don't wait for that yearly or even quarterly review that comes up, hoping that your manager is going to recognize all the great things that you've been doing because they've got a hundred other things that they're focused on. Absolutely. And the, my my jump from general management to director of operations uh, here in Chicago was built very simply on the fact that I would flood the owner's emails every week with ideas. Some of them were great. Some of them were terrible. Bingo night in the steakhouse, probably not good. But I mean, overall, some pretty solid ideas. And whether or not that they all came to fruition was secondary. I was operating as though I had the position and I was doing so trying to be an entrepreneur for the restaurant and not just being in my position for management. Right. And when I was given the title, the owner said, it's just because you just killed me with emails. And that was my way of saying, hey, this is what's going on. This is what I think you should do. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Mm -hmm. And when the big position came up, I got it. I, and you get that the has added, to, you have to do that. Yeah, you have to. And you get the added benefit of probably being the project manager and person who implements the idea from start to finish if you're the one that comes up with it in the first place. So you get the benefit of learning a whole other set of skills, yep. including and, if you're not in a supervisory role, like managing and supervising people. And as you know, the higher up that, that ladder you go, the less support you have and the less oversight that you, it's just based on measurables and profitability. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you know that you're already focusing on that from a restaurant management standpoint, then your development is, is set by the time you make it up to a senior position. Yeah, I really like this idea of self-promotion is self-preservation, but there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. There is, and you bring up a really good point, is that if you're the guy who walks around like, oh, I worked so hard, oh, you know what, I worked 15 hours yesterday. Okay, you suck, I don't wanna work with you, you're a clock watcher, and I can't. That's not what we're talking about. It's not that level of, oh, I'm working so hard. It's Look at the things that I'm doing. It's, it goes back to measurables. I created a thing called a State of the Union to where each week I would send out what we did last week, what we're doing this week, where are our labor numbers, where our opportunities for capturing sales would be. And then I'd follow up with a mini one halfway in the middle of the week to see where we're tracking. Do we have to cut labor? Do we have to adjust this? Where are our sales? All of these things. But then that was also celebrating what I was doing to try to capture more sales and decrease labor and increase the guest experience. Mm -hmm. That's, that's self-promotion, not the person who walks around and goes, oh, I've worked. And, it, and I didn't put that and in the And we all book, know that person. Adam, but right? I, I really, <laughs> should, oh, oh, that's, that's so many people who do that. And yeah. I really should have put that in the book. So, you know. Maybe, maybe version two, surprise again. Yeah. I will definitely, I'll definitely throw that in there. <laughs> yeah, I, I think back to even even when I was in a, uh, you know, on property and I had people reporting directly into me, the there was a distinct difference between the people who, I mean, there's a lot of ways that you can self-promote, air quote, self-promote, mm -hmm. in, in, or in other words, be in your manager's face, promoting right. yourself, right? Kind of getting some, as, as much face time as you can get. Mm -hmm. And those that brought ideas to the forefront always got a lot more attention than the ones who just came in and complained about all the things that were wrong, but never offered any solutions. It Not seems, even an idea of, of something. It seems so basic, but it's so true, is that if you are somebody at any position, any level that's just pointing out problems, then there's no good benefit for, I mean, it's great that you're, you're recognizing challenges, but if you aren't the person that's developing solutions, then that's really, really uh, the challenge. It's kind of what I do with my, my consulting company is I go into a place and figure out what the challenges are and kind of develop strategies. My very, very first job that I ever had, I gave them an entire analysis of everything that was wrong and I'll never forget it. The owner looked at me across the table and goes, Ken, I don't need an alarm. And I was like, yep, got it. I get, I, I figure out all your problems. Now let's talk about solutions. And that is, that is so core to being recognized as being good at what you're doing and worthy of promotion mm -hmm. is bringing that solution that people don't.
Yeah. Yeah. And that, that person who's not naturally inclined to do that, to not come forward with, um, with options, with solutions, even just highlighting issues that need to be fixed because that, that does, you, there's probably an element of extrovert introvert here mm-hmm. with this. Right. And, you know, like you said earlier, people are taught and trained throughout their entire lives to just sort of keep your head down and get your work done. Uh, how do you suggest that those people get the benefit of what we're talking about today? I think it has to be caged in exactly what that is, because when you're surrounded by those extroverted people, and when you mention it, I think of that level of uh, anger, for lack of a better term, the, the number of times that you'll be working as a manager and when your staff members will come over and go, this is still wrong, this is still broken, I'm really... And they're they're upset. It's obviously a challenge for them operationally, but it it's trying to hold you to task. So that is a communication, an important communication, because it's better than not saying anything at all. But that is also someone who is expressing their emotion and opinion to try to get you to in a very driven, angry sort of way. And if you're working alongside that person and you see that you know, speaking out, uh, having ideas, promoting yourself by discussing the opportunities is really ca- couched in, you know, aggression or people that are just really freaked out, then you might not be willing to do that. So back to your question, it's very probably focused on understanding the times in which to do this and the solutions. It's not to go off on a tangent here, but every, every single place that we've ever worked has always said that they have an open door policy, every single place. But then someone will walk over to you with a great idea in the middle of service and you'll go, not now, not now, because you got 15 other things. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, no, no, you don't have open door. Well, you do, but you have to figure out the times. You have to figure out when you're available and present to listen. Because just like with training, When you're going through training and you have an entire class of people, they're walking in knowing that they're going to have to be open to learning. Well, when you're opening your door and having open door conversations and being willing to listen, then you have to be open for that. So if you are on the other side of that, trying to promote yourself as well as better the business, you also have to pick your times and you have to figure out when that person is going to be present. And to me, the majority of that is emails. Because simply I know that when I open my emails, people are going to communicate with me and I have to be in a headspace to listen to that. That's different than being on the floor or a text message. Those seem a lot more immediate. Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt about it. And I mean, it gives it gives the person who's wanting to communicate a frustration or an idea a chance to kind of think through it and word Mm -hmm. it in a way that makes sense rather than just sort of, you know. This, this vomiting words out in the middle of service or, you know, if right. they're or intimidated I've got a great by idea. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, some of the biggest success that I ever had with this was just setting one-on-one meeting times with everybody. It could be a weekly check-in. It could be a bi-weekly or monthly check-in. And I mean, even down to the hourly level, it, even just five or 10 minutes of one-on-one time where you can just check in with the people that report to you and see how they're doing, see if they have anything that they want to talk about. And I mean, oftentimes that's where some of the best ideas and the best uh, like service enhancements came from was those conversations because those hourly people, they're the ones on the front line. They see what's broken and they oftentimes have been talking about it for a long time and collectively amongst them have come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. Adam, I got to ask, did you schedule those? Were they pop-ups? Was it like a breakfast meeting to where multiple people could come to? Because that, especially when you're getting the hourlies together, it's, that's a that's a pretty core thing to do. Um, how did that work? Yeah, uh, great question. A lot of different ways uh, they would be scheduled. So especially for supervisor and above, that we had a scheduled 30-minute meeting on a weekly basis. So I would block out a certain number of hours on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday were big meeting days for me where we would just connect one-on-one and talk about things. Um, oftentimes after standing after lineups, shift lineups, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we'd, we'd pull one or two, uh, hourly employees back and we'd just sit and talk before they went back on the floor to talk about, you know, things that were coming up in that day, things that happened yesterday 
anything that they want to discuss. And we always scheduled a quarterly breakfast or lunch yep. or dinner, kind of depending on the chef. I love the breakfast. With yeah. everybody. And, and again, that's not always a time to talk about like what's wrong and solutions and, and just need to fix that. But those come up. But oftentimes that's just a team building, culture building, everybody getting to know one another, appreciation thing that doesn't end up being just a, you know, in our world anyway, a once a week or I'm sorry, a once a year housekeeping week <laughs> where, you know, we, we celebrate one specific department one week a year and then we kind of move on and then we don't talk about it again for another year. It's re- it was really important to keep those those group um, m- informal meetings uh, on a regular cadence because we, we saw a huge amount of success with it. I bet that when you were there and in that position, you were seen as being a supportive and helpful manager and even more so not being that person who when you walk in the door, everyone goes, oh, God, not him. It's yay because you know that you're there to be another person to help the situation, which is huge. So I think that, that that's great communication. Yeah, I hope I like to think that that's what they thought. <laughs> well, I mean, you you would know because then yeah, everyone you know, would be you really, really you nice to your know. face. Yeah. And then and then just just rat hole you the minute they walk out the yeah, door. Yeah, so. Totally. <laughs> you know, but you bring up an interesting point. Like, you know, in spite of your best efforts as a as a manager, you're mm-hmm. going to have those strong personalities that that don't trust you. Sure. That they don't believe in your vision. Mm-hmm. And they're just contrarians, right? They just they, they disagree with everything. They find a reason everything's not gonna work and that's what makes them happiest. Yep. Um in, you know, going against the grain. Um, and I, this idea of working with, because there are strong personalities in this industry, right? There's so many people take that typical sort of alpha, you know, stand up front. They're big, they're loud, they're boisterous, they push their agenda across the table, they kind of <laughs> ram everything down everybody's throats. Oh my God. I, I could literally see this pre shift in my head. When yeah. You're saying this. Yes, all day. <laughs> we all know. We all know who that th- th- those people are, right? <laughs> all right, we're going to bring big energy today. We're going to go out there. Yeah, that, that person. <laughs> that, oh, I can't, that guy. I can't, I can't stand that person. That yep. person is the worst. I yes. hear you. Um, and, and then you've, you, the flip side to that is you've got people that are, and we were talking about this earlier, the more contemplative, more kind of keep your head down, think about things. And in actually in my, and I, I have actually had this experience personally where, you know, I, I tend to be more contemplative and more, Mm -hmm. um, I, I like to think things, things through, get information, talk with people individually to kind of suss out what issues might be and where we might be able to find a path to a solution. Um, and especially early in my career, I, I had feedback say, from, from managers saying that, uh, you know, I'm not engaged enough. I'm not in, uh, you know, I'm not taking a leadership position enough, which looking back on that, now I know means you're not loud enough, you're not out front enough, you're not right, you exactly. know, boisterous you're not, enough. You're not hulking out in the middle of flying up. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And you know, there's a lot of people that take this approach, that this mm-hmm. more contemplative kind of quiet leadership approach. And, and I know that it takes a tremendous amount of mental, psychological, and even you could say spiritual energy for someone who's a little below that alpha level Mm -hmm. to, to muster the energy to come up. And when they do, they can't live there for very long, which that creates burnout. I mean, that, that's a whole other kind of tying all this together, but those in those alpha positions for some reason, never think that they need to come down to the level of the people that the the energy level that they operate at, especially, Mm -hmm. you know, if they're in a, a, a position of authority over those people. It's so easy to just say you're not taking a, a forward frontline leadership position or, 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 or um, uh, image, you kind of how you're perceived, um, rather than understanding that everybody does work in a different way. Oh, without question. And I think that there is a, the step below alpha. I, I don't use the word beta because it sounds totally like a negative, but yes, I've, I call it boulder theory in the book and I, I pit two different groups. There's the headstrong and then there's the uh, mindful. And what that is, is it's really two different types of energies. 
So I am the person who is introspective. I am the person who will take a longer time because I don't want things to derail. So I'll take, which is good, but it's not good if you're an entrepreneur. It's not good if you're a restaurant owner, because if you look at the numbers of the failure rates of in our industry, then you can say, wow, I don't know if I would do this. Maybe I should go into something totally different. But people who charge ahead to open new places and, and go against what is logic to just build and build and build and build, do so at a rate simply because that's their headstrong nature that makes them that, that person. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to work really well operationally. So the analogy that I use is if you have a huge boulder that's in the middle of a field and the object is whoever can get it to a designated point on the other side of the field first wins and it's going to take like a number of people to push it, there's one team that'll just immediately start pushing it. Doesn't hasn't figured out where that end is, doesn't they just know that it's all about being there first. So they push and push and sometimes it goes in a dish and sometimes it goes the wrong way, but Oftentimes, that boulder makes it there first. And then there's the other team that figures out, well, there's a ditch over there, and I think we need to be over there, and all these other problems could happen. They're the introspective. They're the more cautious. And they'll always get it to the right place at the right time without any sort of falling into a ditch or any sort of misdirection. But if it's a race and the other team's already going that much farther ahead, mm -hmm. they're often going to win. And that's my dynamic with owners. A perfect example is a chef partner that I work with uh, nationally is uh, Fabio Viviani. He wrote the foreword in my book. You might know him from two seasons of Top Chef and about 35 restaurants at this point. And he is blazing right into openings and developments and, big, and that's just who he is. We opened 12 restaurants in 15 months together. And I was the person saying, well, Let's make sure that we're going to do this and this. And he's like, no, no, we're going to do this. And we, he just runs it. And nine times out of ten, that works really well. And then one time out of ten, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And to your question, that's where people like me are very important to people that are team headstrong. Is that people who are running, 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 those, those big alpha type personalities that are owners going against the curb. I often remind them in my communication, I will, I will actively say, hi, I know this is where you're going. I am going to lay out to you all of the challenges that you might see. My job is to let you know where that's going. It's kind of like an HR person. You know, HR is going to advise you, but they're not going to say this is exactly how you should do it. They're, they're an advice. So my, my title with Fabio is consigliere. And I uh, so I said that it's literally on my business cards, consigliere with with Fabio, because that's what I do. Is I I whisper to him and go eh, maybe, and then every once in a while that little bit of caution saves us a lot of headache. Mm -hmm. But that that's that's where I'm at. Yeah, I I, I, <laughs> I love that was it. a long it, one. My apologies. <laughs> I know it's fantastic because it just makes me think about how it both styles are so needed. Correct. Right. It, but the headstrong, typical alpha manager sometimes doesn't realize that they need that other voice in their ear, not necessarily telling them to slow down. Although I am reminded of what's that saying? Slow, is smooth and smooth is fast. Yes. You know, so yeah. that, that that definitely, you know, rings rings in my head a lot of the time. But uh, you need those people surrounding you that can give you perspective on things that maybe you're not looking at. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it's the, it's the, what we've, the, the joke about the let's walk down instead of run down. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a walk, I'm a walk down person and I'll take out the entire group instead of running down to just focus on one task. Because I find that if you're going too fast, then all you're doing is putting out fires and racing. And right. so there has to be some sort of planning, but I would be a terrible restaurant entrepreneur because I would open one restaurant a year instead of 15. Right. And so, yeah, you know, right. if scale was the game. Yeah. If scale was yeah. the game, I'm, I'm not, I'm not your player, but right. it, but I am also the person that I know that whatever I would touch would be correct. Yeah. Yeah. How it, it may be looking back on your own experience. How does someone who's that 
and I, again, like you, I hate to use the word beta, but that's the only word it's, I can think we'll, of. We'll, we will we'll put up the the barriers and say it's okay to use for this conversation. All right, yeah, <laughs> there you go. How do you, how does that person show their worth? How how do you how does that person get into a position where they can be the consigliere? They do so by acknowledging that what they're saying is contrary to what the alpha personality wants. Uh, I have a great example of someone during the mask mandate here in Chicago that 100% did not want their team to wear masks. Worked totally against it, felt that that was bad, felt that it was, and it, it had everything to do with his personal opinions. And that's totally his to have, but it went co completely against the mandates and what the city would say and would bring undue necessary attention to his business. So. Although he was very, very strong in saying, this is what I want, and this is absolutely what I think is best because I don't want to, I want people to walk in and see smiles. I want this, I want that, which all of these things are great reasons why. I was the person who would say to him, great. Now, it's my job to tell you why that might not be a great idea. And I would acknowledge that. And that becomes the same conversations that you have in any group that where you're working with senior management or ownership is when you become that person that's supporting the alpha personality you're doing so by saying listen I'm my job is to tell you all the reasons why so then if these things happen you can't come back and say why didn't you warn me mm. so I'm gonna tell you I'm gonna let you know exactly what could happen and then I'm gonna I'm going to advise you what I would do because somewhere in the middle is the answer it's not 100% Alpha, it can't be, but it's not 100% beta, right? hiding and being. There's a there's a thing in the middle. So when I present, it's okay. Here are the eight things. Here are the eight ditches. Here are the eight misdirections that are gonna have that might happen. How many of these are we worried about? Mm -hmm. Three. Okay, let's let's adjust so we can make sure that we don't have these three things happen. If that means that we have to roll it out next week, or if that means that we have to do something different, then we plan for that. And usually if you're making those pivots, they'll present themselves as being the right answer and you'll show value. In the very beginning, you're always gonna be met with, with aggression because if you're a super alpha person, then you can't be convinced that you're wrong. And it's, so you, so you would never acknowledge that the person's wrong. You would just acknowledge that maybe there's an opportunity to do things a little differently and then show your value over time. Yeah, yeah, and that, that comes right back to what we were talking about at the beginning is bringing solutions. No, yes. just point out problems, bring solutions right. and, and ways to get around those barriers. But you have to be prepared to deal with very blunt criticism. Yes. Right. People, people tell uh, you that all the time, that they want to be told, yeah, just tell it to me straight. I can take it. No, you can't. <laughs> you can't. You can't. <laughs> or you, you can't. Maybe you can one time. <laughs> right. But, but after a while, you, know, you're, you're, you can't. You're just going to crawl on a hole and you go, can't, like You can, <laughs> unless it's something that you put a lot of time and energy and like heart into. And, uh, you, you know, you have a little bit more ownership of it than maybe you typically would. And well, that blunt and, criticism can crush you. And going back to your point of be, having a connection to your team, if you're seen as being the person who's on their side, a true coach, a true mentor, then when you give blunt criticism, it comes from a place of caring. It's not just a place of judgment. And, and that's big. Blunt isn't mean. Blunt isn't mean-spirited. I think I think these two things get conflated a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. People say that you know they're they're straight talkers and they say they tell it like it is. Almost all the time, that is just a screen for you're just a mean person. Right. You're not you're not giving anything <laughs> truly constructive. You're, you're, you're exactly just, yep. You're, you're just, exactly right. Right. So there's a difference between telling people how it is, a truly blunt criticism, uh, but doing it in a way that is intended to elicit some sort of development or change mm -hmm. rather than just somebody walking away feeling crushed and defeated, which is almost, I can tell you, almost all the time what happens because these people have virtually zero emotional intelligence when it comes to this side of their personality. And people that are more introspective and not quite so alpha, they, they will dwell on it. Oh, and yeah. it can it can honestly take the wind out of the sails of a high performing person uh, and, and really turn them into a B or C player because they don't feel 
trusted, respected, you know, you kind of run down the list of attributes, you know, whatever you want. Um, this is a real issue in our industry. I think, you know, as, as, again, as we sort of reshape how we want this work culture to look like, that has to be something that's thought about. This emotional intelligence of how you communicate to people as, uh, as a leader, you have to be aware of it if you want to be successful. Yes, and I think you make a very, very important point about the difference between being blunt and being a jerk. And being a jerk is simply you're, you're the person who's saying that you're a straight shooter while you're just, you just don't have an emotional understanding of how, how to communicate. Uh, but being blunt means that you're, you're curt, you're quick, your timing is, you know, you're not beating around the bush. And that has everything to do, and when people absorb that, and how they internalize it, you're right. You can absolutely change a great player to a less than stellar player because they feel that somehow there's a disconnect with that person. But the thing that I often caution is it does sound like, first off, we're not all there to be friends. And I mean, it is a business. But most importantly, if you live in a world of wanting to be liked versus being respected, then you absolutely will not be able to handle the negative criticism. You can't. And I know this one from, from right at the beginning because I was raised to believe that the worst thing in the world to be was rude and being liked by everybody was the most important point. And I didn't realize why I wasn't growing in the industry and I didn't realize, I didn't understand why I was internalizing so many comments. I talk about one in the book to where a big owner in a big place of, uh, came in and was very curt in his conversation about, you know, the status of the bathroom. And I mean, I dwelled on that forever. And it was because he didn't like me. And okay, he might, he might not, but he didn't live in a world of having to be liked. He lived in a world of being efficient and being respected. And the minute that we get away from that, oh, we're pals and friends, but hey, the way you said that, it'll change your perception. It's why when I talk to managers about how they communicate, I often tell them, don't text. Don't, don't use that as your communication tool, simply because it's, it's much harder to be able to read tone mm -hmm. in the written form, and at least emails give you a longer version, but texts are so short that I could send something to you, Adam, and say, hey, make sure to check the back door before you go, and if you think that I am there and a good supportive manager and we're, you know, you really think that I'm, I'm doing a good job, then you'll be like, yeah, sure, Ken, got you. But yep. if you think that I think that you're not good at your job or I come over as boastful or I'm negative, then that same text will become, what, are you saying that I'm not going to lock the door? I'm not stupid. Uh -huh. And it has everything to do with how the person receives it more than the person who's presenting it. And yeah, and yeah, and the way they receive it is oftentimes a direct result of the way that you've been cultivating interactions with that person over, you know, a certain period of time. Correct. So if you're in the if you're in a position to where you're communicating with others, you know that you have to monitor how you're communicating. And if you are being blunt, be honest, but don't take it as an opportunity to be overly, uh, you know, judgmental in your in your uh, ways of discussing it. Yeah. If you are a person that is receiving blunt criticism, you have to learn to embrace it simply because I, and I think we've all been in these places to where you work for owners, you work for managers, and they're like, Oh, yeah, everything's great and fantastic. They're the same energy people who appreciate are like, all right, they're, they live like this. And then the next thing you know, wham, they, you get popped, you get removed. And you're like, oh, Hey, I thought I was doing really well. No, no, we've just decided to go another way. Wait, I yep. what what's happening? The, I would rather work in an environment to where I knew exactly where I stood. And maybe it wasn't the most kind ways, it wasn't the most, you know, soft ways of, of telling me versus just living in this world of everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine. Okay, we're gonna break up now. Yeah. That's, yeah. That is so true. So true. And that that's the other side of that communication coin, right? Yep. You have to be you have to be willing to give that feedback, right? You can't be, as a manager, you can't be scared to give honest, blunt 
criticism and feedback to people so that, again, it's all, if you come at it from a perspective of how do you want the message to land and what do you want the person hearing it to take away from it? What do you, and what's the action that you want them to take going forward? If that is the lens by which you look at providing feedback and criticism, most of the time you're going to come out much farther ahead than either being, you know, that jerk or mm-hmm. the other person who's, you know, always great and then you know, <laughs> fires the person who, who thinks that they're their best friend. Just, just immediately, yeah. And I think that that also goes to the type of communication that you are using. And I spend a lot of time training managers about when you're working with your staff that you're focusing on measurables. It's not emotion. The number of times that I hear people say, oh, I, I think Todd's you know energy level is bad, or I, I feel that Becky could do better. Well, I think that I feel are great terms for marriage counseling, but they're not great for managing people. Because if you just went to Todd and say, hey, Todd, I feel that you could be a better bartender, what the hell is he supposed to do with that? Like mm-hmm. literally, there's no, there's no measurables, there's no succession planning for getting better. You have to be able to look at tip percentages and check averages and turn times and then coach Todd on where he stands based on everybody else in that position. It's the same communication that, and I I see this more than anything, is they'll put their strong manager or they'll put the strong servers in the strong section and then they'll put the weak servers in the weak section. And the servers will say, well, why am I never over there? Well, you know, and they manage through the scheduling instead of having a conversation. But if they had a conversation and said, hey, Todd, Todd's a four table section, and Becky, you're a two table. That's okay to say because that's true. Different Mm -hmm. people have different, but the most important thing is to say, and Becky, here are the three things that you can do in order to achieve a bigger section. Mm -hmm. And that's the drop that never happens. It's the, I'm going to put my best players in the best spots. Well, you should. It's not T-ball. It's it's major league. Put your aces where they should go. I won't say that term. The aces in place it drives me, and it's another bonker <laughs> one for me. Um, but in doing that, you have to still build the team around you, or else they're just going to sit and atrophy on the bench. Yep. And that's where you go back to having blunt, but absolutely constructive feedback that's based in measurables and not, I feel you could be better. And that's unfortunately the, the, the standard instead of the exception. Yeah. And I think that's such a great segue into your, a lot of your consulting work. Now, a lot of the time as a consultant, you are recognizing problems or you've been, you've been hired to fix a problem mm-hmm. and you do have to give feedback and, and some criticism, but you also have to highlight the road ahead and options that are available. Then you have to implement those in a lot of cases. Um, and for some reason up until, well, actually what's well, including today, but you know, I, I actually, I honestly thought that when the pandemic hit, that the industry was going to be more likely to hire freelancers and consultants to come in, if only because it was a, a more, uh, cost effective way to get major initiatives accomplished when restaurants and hotels had very little internal resources to do those things. And that hasn't quite been the case. Not since at all. Then, has it? No, no, it really hasn't. What? So, you know, so why? So why? Yeah, so, what, so, what, so why? <laughs> Selfishly, you know, I'd love to get your answer. So why? But also, um, you know, what, what should businesses be looking for when they hire a consultant that may, that may, help the industry at large kind of get over this fear of doing it because industries around the world have been doing it for decades, right? Mm -hmm. It's just for some reason, hospitality has just not embraced it. So what's, what's the deal? So I think you have to go back to the conversation about showing your worth to an alpha when it comes to being that person and you right off the bat, and I have it on my website, legitimately, the first thing that we talk about is the term consultant because it is a pejorative in our industry. And I got a resume literally this morning and it happens all the time to where someone's been out of work for a certain amount of time. And so they just put down consultant and that's Mm. their response. They don't really have a consulting company. They're not really doing anything, but it's always been the fill in for stop gaps between 
position saying that they were consulting, which usually meant that they were bartending in a friend's bar. Uh, meanwhile, when they did, when people hire consultants, so many restaurants have horror stories about having hired somebody, and then they just came in and they were the alarm. They just pointed and said all the things that were wrong, and then they took a check, and then they left, and nothing changed. So how Corgan Hospitality works is that we have to base it simply on what is measurable and what will live beyond the time that we're there. So if you come in and say, hey, I want to make service better, well, how are you measuring that? Mm -hmm. Is that Yelp reviews? Is that secret shop reports? Or is it just your opinion? If it's just your opinion, I'll never win. And I can't, I can't, I can tell you, teach you 15 different ways from training to development to strategies on how to make service better. But unless you're figuring out your own measurables that is, we can both agree on, because I'm not going to take money until we both say, yep, we both agree that this is good. Uh, and that's being able to kind of become that person and become that company that is willing to focus on measurables has been kind of the difference that's worked well for us. But I think the mm -hmm. reason that people aren't using consultants as much is that they are seen as fill-ins, stop gaps. I've had people who've, friends who, but I, I have zero managers, Ken, can you come and hold down the fort for a week? Yeah, I'll do mm -hmm. that, I'll, I'll help you out because you're, but that's not what, that's not what consulting is. That's not a consult, that's a, like a right. task force slash exactly. paper. Exactly, that's just a, you're <laughs> yeah. just being deployed in. Uh, so what do you, what have you been finding? Yeah, much the same, actually. A lot of the, the discussions that I've been having are, interestingly enough, in the entrepreneurial space within hospitality is where a lot of the interesting work is going on. The big box, huge companies that have been doing it the same forever, where the same people are still in positions of authority, that were, you know, their business may have been impacted by the pandemic, but them personally, not much, not maybe much, other yep. than having to probably maybe work a front desk or a few service shifts, <laughs> uh, you know, where they normally wouldn't do that. You know, those are the ones where, uh, what I, what I've seen in, in my own personal experience where coming up in a lot of these companies, the feeling was that there's always the bringing somebody in from the outside can't possibly be successful because they don't understand how we do things. Mm -hmm. They don't understand our thought process. They don't understand our metrics. They don't understand our culture, whatever, like, you know, name the thing. And there's always been this, um, uh, just a, a, a mental roadblock for, for trying to find that person from the outside to come in. And there's, I mean, if you go, sure, you're, you're right. It's a pejorative and a lot of people use it as a filler, even though they weren't, um, they, they weren't actually a consultant. But, you know, you can go on LinkedIn and like there's a lot of high powered um, consultants in the industry out there that have had unbelievable careers that are now trying to be of service to the industry in a different way. And they mm -hmm. bring, in some cases, decades of experience uh, with them in, in working with all kinds of different companies, all kinds of different brands and many different positions and different economic conditions, different markets. Like they kind of sort of have, have a lot of things. Um, and... I truly do believe that those people can provide a huge amount of value because the benefit is that they don't look at things the same way that you do within your organization. Because if you may not be in the position that you're in, if you had a different point of view, if you didn't have this sort of this uh, confirmation bias around the boardroom table where everybody just sort of agrees because that's how you always do things. It's that outside perspective that often can leapfrog your business ahead of your competition and really get you reaching towards what your ultimate goals are. Um, and and I, I really, truly hope that we start to look at things a little bit differently in hospitality um, because we've got, you know, there's a lot of work to do. Yes. And I think that if you find clients that are willing to be invested in the operational aspect and help to develop, that's great. I always know it's never going to be a good fit whenever I do my initial consultation, sit down with an owner. And they say, I just want this fixed. I just want somebody to come in and fix operations. Because that means that they want to be hands off. Mm -hmm. And that hands off approach is probably what got them there in the first place. So if you find a group, whatever size, 
to where they're like, we need an outside perspective, an unbiased opinion that comes in that helps us to develop strategies that we can continue to implement beyond your short tenure with us, that those are the clients I take. Those are the people that I work with because I know that at the end of the day, they're gonna be more than happy with what I've able to provide and they're gonna see value in that. Mm -hmm. It's, good. you're good. Uh, what I, was, I mean, that's such great advice for those people that you know are, I mean, even right now that are consultants uh, out of necessity because they've lost their jobs due to the pandemic. So they've decided to turn to consulting and, and you know, truly are doing that work um, and have decided maybe that they like this lifestyle better than that, you know, that grind of being in the restaurant or on property, you know, five, six, seven days a week. Um, that coming at solutions from a measurable perspective and that live long after you're done working on the project, um, I mean, those are two very strong ROIs that can, I think it, at least maybe get your second foot in the door in that, that sales conversation before you get hired. Right. And I think that you make the point of people who are turning to uh, being consultants. I think that I've probably worked harder as a consultant than I ever did in operations simply because mm -hmm. it's a justify your existence daily sort of deal. And it is a grind. There's no doubt about it. So I think that there's a romantic aspect about it to where people will think, oh, you know what, I've always wanted to be my own boss. Well, you're not your own boss. You're the, you're the employee of literally everyone else and you have thousands of bosses and it's not easier, it's harder. So that's part of what I want to do with Corgan is I want to hold account, account um, consultants to task so that the few of us that are of value can help build the industry. And we can get rid of, you know, push out all the people that are just fake. They're just mm -hmm. not They're They're just the people that come in and point and take a check. And if we can do that and kind of band together, I've got several other consultants that I work with that I've had conversations with that are a similar mindset. I, I would love to have a coalition. I would love to be able to actually build a world to where it wasn't seen as a pejorative, but we have a lot of work to do. A lot of work to do. There's no doubt. Ken, this was a, a fantastic discussion. Um, if, I enjoyed uh, this. If, so I can't believe how quick I just looked at the time. I, that, that was <laughs> that was ridiculously. It's fast. like an, almost an hour. It just like flies wow. by. It's it's wow. crazy. Um, if anybody wants to get a hold of your book, where should they go? Amazon is the easiest place. It's the surprise restaurant manager and it's available on uh, on Audible, the audiobook and then the regular book. And most importantly, the Kindle version, the ebook, is only 99 cents. And I did that simply because I want the information out. It's more important to me to get the information out to people to support the industry than it is for that to be a profit center. So please, if you're at all interested, download the book. It's 99 cents. And I think that you'll find something of value in it. I love that. That's such a such a great service to the industry. I'll uh, I'll definitely link to the book, the Amazon link, but also the ebook uh, link in the show notes if anybody wants to grab that. And uh, it's a good read. Thanks. Uh, thanks again. Anyway, Ken, great discussion. Appreciate you being on the show. And uh, you as talk well. To you soon. Take care.